Hello, welcome to the Faith to Pen the Faith. My name is William Hemsworth. Great to be with you. My guest, he's a, a author, speaker, has a daily radio program called Hands on Apologetics on Virgin on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Gary Machuda. Gary, how are you doing today? Doing awesome, William. How are you doing? Oh, I'm well. We we just got through a little cold snap here in Tucson and it's warming back up, so we are good. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, what how do you define a cold snap? A couple on on Monday it actually got down to 32 degrees. Wow, that woke is up cold. And, woke up and it was 32 degrees and the, the high the high on Monday was 53. That was our winter probably. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is cold. Yikes. Yeah, but we'll, we'll we'll take whatever we can get. We got some rain with it, so we'll take it. Okay. So nice. I pr- appreciate you coming on to talk about a topic that's well, you've done a lot of research on. That's the Deuterocanon. Mm-hmm. And of course, you've literally written the book on it. There's one of them here. <laughs> um You've written many others. <laughs> um, so just for the sake of clarity, I know as Catholics, we call it Deuterocanon. Our Protestant friends call it Apocrypha. Why the difference between the two names? Uh, okay. Well, yeah, the difference stems from the fact that uh, Catholics and Orthodox understand the seven Old Testament books. And I should probably name them just because we're going to be talking about them. Uh, Sirach, Wisdom, Tobit, Judith, Baruch, uh, first and second Maccabees, and also a couple of chapters in Daniel and some sections in Esther. We call them Deuterocanon because we understand them to be inspired by God and full members of sacred scripture. So for Catholics and Orthodox, we kind of see a subdivision within the Old Testament of the proto-canonical books, those that everybody shares, and the deuterocanonical books. But, you know, according to our understanding, there's no difference in terms of inspiration, authority, or anything like that. It's just a subdivision, just like uh, there's no difference between the law, the prophets, and the writings, right? Uh, but that's beca- but Deuterocanon comes from this idea that it's part of the canon. Now, Protestants don't believe that. They believe that, uh, well, there's a variety of beliefs, but generally that it's not inspired. It's not part of the canon. And so they use the term apocrypha, which is Greek for hidden. And the idea is that it's not publicly read as sacred scripture in their churches. So since they don't believe it's inspired, they call it Apocrypha. Since we believe it's inspired, we call it Deuterocanonical. Gotcha. Okay. And I know there's a lot of objections out there, and I know you've done a lot of research on it, so I wanted to run some of these objections by you. Okay. I know our listeners probably have a, have heard them all. Yeah. Um, so one of the ones I hear a lot is, the Deuterocanon, the, those books were not written in Hebrew, and therefore we don't accept them. Uh, yeah. How would you counter that? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would say show me somewhere in Scripture where God says, I will not reveal my word unless it's written in Hebrew, right? Uh, that's, a, that's problematic in itself. In fact, the protocanon, sections of the protocanon are in Aramaic, so technically they're not Hebrew either. So if God can speak to his people through Hebrew or Aramaic language, he could certainly speak through other languages. And uh, right before the New Testament, uh, if you look at Daniel's prophecy of the four beasts, you know that there were uh, four empires, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Seleucid, or Greek, and then the Romans. So right before the New Testament, actually the Deuterocanon covers this, is the Greeks— and they occupy the Holy Land. So Greek becomes the lingua franca. And uh, so obviously if God's going to talk to his people, he can talk to it in Greek. And finally, William, um, I don't understand this because Christians believe that God inspired the New Testament. New Testament's written in Greek. So right. I don't understand why uh, somehow or other God couldn't say, you know, reveal himself in the Old Testament in Greek. Right, and that's a good point. Do you think it goes back to that argument where the Jews never accepted these books? Oh. Do you think it may go back to that? Yeah, you know, the thing is, after Christianity, around the beginning of the second Christian century, rabbinical Judaism had its own self-definition. It made its own uh, canon, if you will, okay? And this is after the time of Christ. Why they did it is not really clear. Uh, They give some ideas, but it's not really sure. So a lot of people will speculate that unless certain criteria were met, these rabbis wouldn't accept books as sacred. 
And one of those is that has to be written in the Hebrew language. Uh, but that doesn't work either because um, I don't know if you know this. I'm sure you probably know it. Maybe your uh, listeners don't. But of the seven Deuterocanonical books, only two are written in Greek. The other ones are written in either Aramaic or Hebrew. So if that was the criteria, it would only get rid of two books, uh, Second Maccabees and the Book of Wisdom. Right. That's fascinating, because at the Dead Sea Scrolls, didn't they find a whole book of Tobit in Hebrew? Uh, well, there's a fragment in Hebrew. Yeah, a couple of fragments in Hebrew and Aramaic, too. So they have Tobit and Sirach. Okay. Uh, and we found Hebrew, Sirach, and Masada. Um, and uh, so there's there's plenty. I think even Cairo Geniza has some Hebrew, Sirach, as well. But, I mean, even if at the time of the Reformation, William... The reformers knew that these books were originally in Hebrew. Um, the, there was that was pretty much the course because you could back translate very easily. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not really sure where it comes from. I think it's just people grasping at straws trying to explain why the rabbis rejected it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another objection I hear a lot is. You know, Jesus and the apostles quoted with "It is written," but this phrase wasn't used for the Deuterocanon books. And I know you you've addressed this in so many different places. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah uh, boy, there's uh, you're right. There's so many ways to skin this cat. Um, one thing, uh, yeah. First, they'll say, "Well, Jesus." And the apostles quote the Old Testament with these formal phrases. It is written, thus saith the Lord, stuff like that, a lot. Okay. And they'll say they'll do it so many times, yet not once do they do it to a deuterocanonical book. Therefore, you know, the silence is deafening that, uh, you know, they obviously deliberately excluded them. Um, well, I'm crazy enough, William, to actually look up all these different times they use these formal quotations. And it's true, though. I mean, there are a lot of formal quotations in the New Testament like that. But what people don't realize is that, although there are a lot of them, they're only in reference to a relatively small group of books. They don't quote it as written or formal introduction to every book in the proto-canon. In fact, some books aren't even quoted. Some aren't even alluded to in the New Testament. So the other thing I'd point out is, why restrict your inquiry only to formal citations? I mean, there's other ways in which the New Testament could affirm the canonicity or inspiration of a book. Uh, for example, it could reference a book. Uh, the New Testament doesn't have any clear-cut citation from the book of Jonah, for example. But since Jesus speaks about the sign of Jonah, people will take that reference as, well, Jesus obviously accepted Jonah as inspired. And that's fair enough, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the Deuterocanon, you know, all of a sudden it has to be a formal citation. References don't count. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I pointed this out in the debate, and I have some videos up on YouTube, where in Hebrews 1135b, Jesus, uh, the writer of Hebrews, excuse me, the inspired author of Hebrews, references the Maccabean martyrs as they're recorded in 2 Maccabees 6 and 7. And he does so with a formal introduction. And this is often missed, but the formal introduction is, it is attested. Um, so somewhere in the Bible of this inspired author, it is attested that some were tortured, refused release for the sake of a better resurrection. So apparently, the author's Bible, Old Testament Bible, included 2 Maccabees. So this is on par with it is written. In fact, in the video, I go through all of the instances in the Epistle of Hebrews. Uh, it is attested, it always refers to some sort of biblical source, something attested to in Scripture. It's never used for anything else. And so the Maccabees are attested to in Scripture, therefore they're part of the Bible. Um, so I think that's a, a good answer to anyone who would insist that it must say it is written and cite a deuterocanonical book. Right, and one of the other instances I like is the golden rule. It's kind of like the reverse is in Tobit as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right, so another one, and 
and I know this is uh, probably a favorite of yours. Jerome denied the Deutero canon, so why should we accept it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. He also affirmed papal authority and, you know, Marian teachings and stuff like that. But when it comes to the canon, you know, he's infallible. Um, yeah, that's a lo- Jerome, by the way, is, I think, the only father, the only earliest father that Protestants can point to who actually calls the Deutero canon apocrypha. Um, and he rejects in a, in all sense of the term uh, its inspiration. And the reason he did this was because of a faulty uh, line of thinking. He was translating the Bible into Latin, and uh, he was looking at all these different Greek texts, the Septuagint, the Aquila, and so on. And he also knew Hebrew. He could write he- read Hebrew. And so he saw all these Greek translations, he saw that the rabbis only had one Hebrew translation. So he came up with the idea, well, since the Hebrews only have this text, you know, one text, and the it must go back to the original. So anything that wasn't found in this Hebrew text was rejected, and anything found in it was accepted for him. So that's what he called Hebrew truth. It was kind of his uh, rule of thumb when it came to Scripture. So, of course, the Hebrew text didn't include the Deuterocanonical books, and so Jerome becomes the first Christian in history to assign it to the quote-unquote Apocrypha, and he, where he denies it's canonical, it's not inspired, you can't use it to confirm doctrine. And uh, so when the Reformers eventually wanted to get rid of these books, they appealed to Jerome. But, the, but William, here's the clincher, though, and I, I always point this out, it's amazing. The church knew Jerome was wrong. Why? Because it accepted these books as scripture. In other words, sacred traditions, as they included. And so there were a series of councils in Carthage and Hippo and various popes reaffirmed the Deuterocanon as canonical scripture. But we couldn't demonstrate he was wrong until the 1940s with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was only then we realized that in the first century, There were numerous different versions, Hebrew versions in circulation. And so the one text that Jerome had uh, was just really a quirk of history, more or less, that uh, his whole idea of Hebrew verite or Hebrew truth uh, simply doesn't fly. And so Jerome actually has been demonstrated to be false, at least his reasoning for getting rid of these books. And you touched on something there, Gary, because there are those out there who say that it wasn't until the Council of Trent that the church determined that these books were scripture. Yeah. And I know you touched on this already. Can you give us a brief history of how that actually is not the case? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. I, there was actually a series of councils, as I just mentioned. Right. Um, and this is largely in the West, because when Jerome rejected these books, it, he circulated his ideas in the Latin Vulgate. So, The Latin-speaking West was affected by this question. The Greek-speaking East wasn't, okay? So in the West, you have a series of reaffirmations of the historic Christian canon, beginning in 393 with the Council of Hippo, uh, Carthage 3 and 380, uh, I think it's 387, and then uh, uh, the Council of Carthage uh, 17 later, I think in the early 5th century. So three African councils reaffirmed the canon. Pope Innocent I reaffirms the canon. You have Galatius and Her- Hermodius also affirming the canon. It, and what happens in the East is that these North African councils are adopted as part of what was called the African Code. So it was a series of uh, canons that were accepted in the East, and therefore the Universal Church. It was accepted at the Council of Trullo, which is a a council that the Eastern Church recognizes, and it was tacitly accepted in uh, the Second Council of uh, Nicaea, I believe. So it was part of the law of the Church. I mean, even uh, Pope Nicholas I claims that this, that it's part of the law of the Church. And, you know, for me, a clincher also is that a couple hundred years before the Protestant Reformation at the Ecumenical Council of Florence, it gives a canon. And guess what? It's the exact same books that are affirmed in uh, in Trent. So there's a long stream of uh, inter- uh, long stream of um, 
ecclesiastical affirmations from the 4th century all the way to the time of Trent. And really, when it comes up to the Council of Trent, if you read the Acts and the letters of those there, what you find is they basically just rubber stamped what was accepted at Florence. And uh, they reasoned that they didn't want to add anything to it because they felt like the matter was already closed back in the fourth century. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you one other objection that I saw in a Facebook group a couple days ago. And this this was a first. And when you go in these groups, you hear some crazy questions anyway, but (laughs) yeah, but the question was the early church fathers never quoted from those books. So they're not accepted. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was the first for me. (laughs) <laughs> they never quoted from the books. Yeah, that's a first for me, too. Um, <clears throat> uh, the answer is no. <laughs> that's right. It's pretty easy to refute. Um, in fact, not only did they cite these books, but they even cited them explicitly as scripture, uh, and they quoted these books. Um, in my book, The Case for the Deuterocanon, I actually went through the first uh, four centuries of the church, looking at mostly material that's available in English to see exactly how often they were quoted and how they were quoted. If you could give me a second here, I'll actually bring up the uh, the numbers. Okay. But in the end, I found that I found 209 instances in 109 sources by 33 authors who explicitly quoted the Deuterocanon as inspired scripture. So they would say, as the scripture says, it is written, the Holy Spirit says, yada, yada, yada. Then I found, in addition to that, um, 235 instances in 130 sources from 39 authors where they used the Judo canon to confirm doctrine. So, and this is only the first four centuries of the church. Right. Uh, so I, I think that more than enough kind of blows out of the water that no one ever quoted these books. Yeah, definitely. And that, like I said, that was the first time I heard that. I just thought you'd have fun with it. That's all. So I thought I'd mention it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, the easy thing is you could just come up with a single quote and blow that out of the water. But yeah, that was something that really surprised me, William, because I actually got this idea of a piece in an English paper written back in the 1800s. I mean, that's how nerdy I am, always searching for material. And I, I think it was written by a priest. And he he mentions eight or nine early church fathers who quoted the Deuterocanon to support doctrine, like, you know, the deity of the Holy Spirit, the incarnation, stuff like that. And I thought, well, William, you know, I thought, well, if there's eight or nine, I bet if I really looked, I could probably see 15 maybe, right? <laughs> and then once I started looking, then I realized, whoa, there is a ton of usage. I mean— the Deuterocanon was very important with discussions concerning the Trinity, the Incarnation, uh, all sorts of issues in the early church. And not only did the Orthodox early church fathers cite them, but even the heterodox ones like the Arians and so would also appeal to these texts. So this was common currency within Christianity. They, they both believed that it was capable of confirming doctrine all the way up until you get to Jerome where it's refused. And from then on, all those who followed Jerome. So through history, we have attestation that these books are scripture. Of course, we come to the Reformation. Was Luther's appeal primarily to Jerome and what he thought? Yeah, he kind of backs into it. Um, And that's one thing about Luther is uh, he... um, he tends to back into uh, ideas. Um, now, I, I've released some videos. We'll talk about that later. But uh, I go into this also a bit in Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger, because um, Luther actually flip-flops on the Deuterocanon. Early on in the Protestant Reformation, remember, he, the October 31st, 1517, what, what? Nailed the 95 Thesis, right? The beginning of the Reformation. But there are three written debates he has with Catholics between that and 1519, where he claims he's going to use the scripture as a source, sometimes even canonical scripture, and he uses the Deuterocanon in debate to serve as proof. So he, it seems initially he's A-OK with these books being scripture in the fullest sense. 
It isn't until in 1519 he goes against Johann Eck, who's a Catholic theologian. And at the Leipzig Disputation, uh, Second Leipzig Disputation, uh, he um, Eck corners him with Second Maccabees 1246, and uh, along with some other texts as well. And Luther answers the, the he disputes the interpretation of the other texts, but when it comes to Second Maccabees, he says that you can't enter these uh, Second Maccabees into debate to serve as proof because they're not in the canon. Okay, so Act presses them on that, and he says, "Well, the Church Councils say they're canonical, you know, Hippo, Carthage, Florence, and all that." And then, he, then Luther has to go to Jerome. Right, that's when he appeals to Jerome, and then Act points out that Augustine believed these were canonical. You know, he just piles on, and at that point, Luther actually he pulls the parachute and says, "Well, the Church can't give these books authority that it doesn't possess by its own power or its own virtue." In other words, he, uh, Luther says that these books aren't canonical in virtue of their own power. And what he means by that is they don't preach Christ. He didn't hear his doctrines being preached by these books. And to that extent, they're not canonical. And so from that point on, he actually develops this idea of Christ preach, that the gospel becomes the criteria for the canon. And so if a book preaches the gospel, to that extent, it's canonical. If it doesn't, even if it comes from an apostle, it's not canonical. And uh, th that leads to ultimately him rejecting the Epistle of James as straw, and also the other deuterocanonical books of the New Testament, at least temporarily. Um, and uh, but the thing is, Protestants, of course, they don't follow that because it's a very subjective criteria, isn't it? It is. And so um, basically, uh, that's kind of left to the dust of history. But nevertheless, yeah, that's what happens. He gets backed into it. He has to appeal to Jerome. And by the way, subsequent Protestants, Kelvin and the others, also appealed to Jerome as well. But like I mentioned before, now that Jerome has fallen, at least his idea of Hebrew verity with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, that means that really the historic case for the Protestant canon, it doesn't have any foundation. I want to transition to your, well, your new, one of your project, your newer project, the Apocrypha yeah. Apocalypse, the YouTube channel. Yes. I'm curious, how'd you come up with the name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to come up with names, you know, catchy names. This isn't a very catchy name, though. Uh, actually, it's the title of a book that I was going to publish. I don't think I am, but maybe I will. And uh, I just came up with it. Like you mentioned, Protestants understand these books to be apocrypha. Right. And uh, what I want to do is unveil or reveal that these books are actually scripture, hence the apocalypse. Apocalypse means unveiling. And since Apocrypha Apocalypse kind of rolls off the tongue a little bit, I, I chose that. If you can think of a better title, I'll change the name of the channel. Well, no, uh, I think that's a good title, especially if someone goes in to search Apocrypha, it'll come right up. Yeah, so I that's think, true. So I think that's good. So what I've watched a few videos on there. Um, you've, you have some rebuttal videos. You've done some other great things. What are some things you do on the channel? Yeah, basically, I'm taking all the information that I have in my books, and especially that new book that I haven't published yet. And I'm just putting in video form because I don't think a lot of people read. At least I think I could reach a lot more people with this information uh, through video YouTube stuff rather than in print. Um, so I'm trying to break it down, make it a little bit more simpler, but I want to also give meat. You know, I want them to see the sources that I'm not trying to pull a rabbit out of a hat. And just get it out in circulation because a lot of this information you won't find anywhere. You certainly won't find it on YouTube or something like that. And, uh, and it's also great things that Catholics can share with their non-Catholic friends uh, who may have questions about the Apocrypha. They can uh, find a video that addresses it and shoot it off to it to them, you know, share it with them. And uh, also, I'm partnering with uh, William Albrecht from patristicpillars.com. I know he's been on your show. Um, William uh, is, speaks three languages, English, German, and Spanish. And so he's going to do some Spanish language stuff on the Deuterocanon because there's just nothing out there. Great. 
Yeah, so uh, you said we're rocking and rolling. Um, I'm going to have Trent Horn on. He's doing a debate with Steve Christie on the Deidre Cannon this Friday, uh, the 13th. We're going to have uh, have him on talk about in- inerrancy, that whether it, it affects the question of the canon. Now I'm also going to have uh, Dr. Douglas Beaumont with us on a live stream. We're going to talk about the book Wisdom, whether it denies creation ex nihilo. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Yeah, so it's going to be lots of weird, eclectic, but fun topics. And so, I, I mean, we're having a lot of fun doing that. Well, you talk about meat on the bone. I was watching one of your rebuttal videos. Um, I, forget the, I forget the YouTube channel's name that you were rebutting. But, of course, he's appealing to Josephus. Oh, so, yeah, yes. And then you say, no, it's a bad translation. And you list, like, two other translations right next to show that the translation there was just not that good. So there was a lot of meat on the bone, a lot of stuff everyone could learn. Yeah. So is there anything else you've been up to? I know you, you have the radio show and everything else. Oh, that's kept me hopping, just uh, getting guests like yourself on my show. Um, and uh, I also teach online apologetics. So this is right in the middle of our academic season uh, for homeschool connections doing an apologetics that way, and then the Apocrypha Apocalypse thing. I'm, I'm trying to, to uh, get videos out on a regular basis and, um, and kind of get the visibility going. So I really urge people watching, if you haven't checked out the channel, please subscribe. And also I'm on Patreon, so if you want to help defray some of the cost, uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's keeping me hopping, William. I, I just don't have anything else on my... Uh, uh, radar screen. I finished the manuscript for my next book, and that's already at the publisher. It's going to be published by Catholic Answers Press. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm just trying to keep afloat. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot going on. How often yeah. are you? How often are you putting videos out on your channel? I'm trying to do it at least weekly. Okay. Uh, like I think this week I, we're going to unload three videos simultaneously, but they're all related. Uh, but I'm hoping at least weekly and maybe a couple of times per month do a live stream. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. All right, Gary, any closing remarks on the Deutero Canon before I yeah. let you go to enjoy the rest of your day? It, you know, it's a fascinating subject and it's one that is very important with Catholic Protestant issues. Um, because, uh, you know, if you want to be a Bible Christian, you need to know you have the right Bible. And, Unfortunately, um, Bible Christians today are missing seven Old Testament books, and that can affect how you read the Word of God. And so, you know, we're in an enviable position, William, of trying to uh, defend the Word of God and give people the fullness of Scripture, you know, which is ironic because usually Catholics are, you know, accused of uh, trying to get the Bible out of the hands of the lady. Well, we're right. trying to get more of the Bible in the hands of Protestants. So, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, and for Catholics, hey, it's a super cool subject. I, I've i been studying it for years, and I'm always learning new things. Great. And, Gary, what are your, what's your website so people can check out your, your awesome stuff that you have out? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, www.handsonapologetics.com. All right, and everyone, check out the YouTube channel, Apocrypha Apocalypse, and also I'll link that in the notes as well. Um, awesome. Gary, I thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Hey, anytime, William. It's a lot of fun. All right. God bless. You too.